to create their list or contact us for further information. Some driving forces, we had some significant change across the university, including cultural change. Uh, for example, always open for business, so we have 24-7, uh, and also developing partnerships. We had limited and shrinking resources, so we decided we couldn't do anything just in case, and we had to have very efficient workflows. As I said, we had two separate systems for submitting reading lists to us. One was using Equella, one was using Higher Use, very confusing for everybody. So one of the driving forces was a better user experience for our academics and students. The responsible staff that we had, we had a group of six people to do it all, to do everything. Um, we created the course readings team at the end of last year, which is a manager and three core staff. And I'll talk a little bit about some other things that happened after that. Um, at USC we had a staged approach which gradually expanded to more library staff as configuration and technical best practice workflows were established. So at the end of 2016 we commenced promotion and marketing across the university and encouraged nominations for the first semester um, 2017 pilot. Um, and we ran a pilot for two, two semesters which was mainly led by systems staff, so at the time it was just Meredith and I joined midway through uh, 2017 and we engaged um, their library liaisons to sort of train and support the academics. 2018 we handed over to the library staff to operationalise and they also ran pilots, so the, the numbers g grew but we sort of did have two years of pilot. Um, they fine-tuned, um, expanded workflows, etc. And um, then we did a university-wide rollout this year. Our driving forces, we really had no reading list solution other than a, a link to Primo through Blackboard, just through your, to the course reserves. And there was no central place for course materials other than what was in our catalogue. Um, and also to improve the university's copyright compliance and reporting, that was one of the driving forces. And responsible staff, so it was predominantly just a project manager and officer and myself um, as the system staff at first and then led to the rest of the library. Um, so Renee Vandor from Flinders University. We also did a staged approach. So we had a pilot in semester one 2018. Um, so we had 14 instructors and that was about um, 38 topics took it up. Um, so we had 40 reading lists because one topic decided to do multiple lists, so that was exciting. Um, we then rolled out to two full colleges and the pilots um, in semester two of last year. And the reason why we chose to do that is because we were doing the Equella import. So we, um, previously at Flinders, we always did the reading lists. We did everything for the um, academics and the academics were about to go through a restructure. So we thought this probably isn't a great time to uh, add to their stress levels. So we decided to continue the same service and just move all of our reading lists from our old system into our new system. Um, mm -hmm. And the Equella import, while beneficial in the end, did take a long time, but we got it done. So this year um, we had full um, rollout to the university with the readings LTI link embedded in every Moodle site by default. Um, so in semester two, it was hidden, um, which caused some problems. So this year, we made it by default unhidden. And if they don't want to use a reading list, they have to act actively go in and hide it. Um, our driving forces were better reading list management for our staff. So um, previously, staff couldn't do anything to their reading list. There was a delay between getting readings to us and then um, to students, so we wanted to have a better service. Um, so it was about three years uh, Flinders was looking at a new reading list management system and we went with Leganto because it gives configuration control back to the library, which we didn't have previously. Um, for the rollout, we had a project team. So from the library, it was me and Matt Hooper, I think a lot of you might know that name. Um, we also had a project manager. Um, we brought in the OLS team, who's the systems team, so they do a lot of the IDS support for our Moodle. We also then had the Kilt team, which is divided into two things. We had um, learning designers and the Moodle support. So it sounds like a lot of people, but really it was only like one person from each of those teams made the project management team. Um, for the reading staff side who actually did the work, the library went through a restructure um, at the beginning of the pilot. 
So we went from having a readings team to being in the resources department, which is amazing, but it does mean that our team, um, so we have five technical staff who now work in five different little areas. So that was our team during implementation, and I'll talk about workflows later. Hello, um, I'm Sarah, and I'm from Bond. So um, for us, our rollout method was that we had two semesters of pilot, so um, we have three semesters uh, every year and everyone sort of has to do that. So last year we had um, the May semester and the September semester. We started with 10 lists and then went to about 50 lists or 60 lists. Um, and our idea was to just open it up to everybody in 2019, which we, which we did. Um, so during the, during the pilot we had um, access to the Leganto sandbox for everybody who was involved from the library, academics and in the project. Um, and we also had them linked up to like Blackboard sandbox sites as well so they could have a really good play and a test before we went live or had the production um, software. And our approach was that we wanted to empower our academics to make lists themselves so we were very um, I'll talk about it more later, but we were very careful to give them good training so that they could just take it on and go for it um, themselves. So um, with, the, with our project, we had, um, uh, as part of the project team, we had just Peter and myself. So Peter was the technical lead as well as project manager, and she's very experienced in both of those things, so we were very lucky. Um, I kind of acted for the librarian team, so I took on all those roles um, just for the, for the pilot. Um, we also had a project advisory board which um, partly consisted of all the deans, of, associate deans of learning and teaching. So they were all on board from the beginning, they all knew about it and they were able to encourage their own academics to try and um, get on board. Um, our reasons were that we, we had a sort of an end of life digitisation um, system that was a bit scary and could maybe topple at any moment. No, it was fine, but it, it did need upgrading. Um, we also had nowhere really to put any open access resources um, or uh, our arch archives. Um, and then the quality of citations inside of the Blackboard was very patchy to say the least. So, you know, missing metadata, links to things that we, or references to things we didn't actually hold copies of and that kind of stuff. And we also wanted a better way to support copyright. Um, within the library as well, probably one of the main teams that was affected was our course reserves teams, so the people who do putting things into the short term loans area and digitising, so talk a bit about that, um, more about that later. Hmm. Okay. So does anyone have questions that they'd like to ask after the uh, first, sorry, do you want to go yeah. Yeah. the implementation? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Renee, so with your ingress from Aquila, yeah. were you, um, obviously you were creating citations every reading this, were you also creating, doing any sort of digital objects to create digital representation of the records? No. So we, from Aquella, um, we decided to just get the citations. So we got all of the citation information and put it through. Um, one of the reasons why was um, previously in Aquella we had varying standards of scans. Um, so we try now to have, you know, really high quality scans, so um, text recognition, clean, no black marks and things like that. But we did have a lot of stuff in Aquella that perhaps wasn't needed or was really poor quality. So we decided this was a good opportunity um, to make sure that um, our quality of scans was good. It also, as I mentioned earlier, we had a restructure. So it also helped with training. So having staff have to go through and add the digital objects um, facilitated the training because they were context shifting a lot. So even though it was a lot of work, it helped um, the workflow sink in for them. So. Yeah, we got all of the data from Aquella, but yeah, manually imported the citation uh, scans as we needed them. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm interested that you all took different approaches to the level of training that you gave to your academics. Can you perhaps variously comment quickly on how you think that affected their take up of the system? Um, we do have a section in a little bit uh, staff and student okay. engagement that might cover yeah, some of those. Maps. Yeah. Actually, I've just got a quick question. Did any of you come from sort of an established unit of study system to Leganza? So we were using Sierra and then we purchased e Reserve. So we went through a two year period of bringing everybody on board with that. Now we've got Alma Primo since the start of this year. So a question for us is do we move from e Reserve to Leganza? Um, so one question I have 
it, it was like I had to mm -hmm. make an easy sort of export of metadata for one system, which is pretty modern to that system. And you get lots of, because we struggled coming from Sierra to e reserve was, was a nightmare with the metadata. There was so much cleanup and hours spent on, on making sure that e reserve could read what we had because it was pretty shocking. Um, but it's pretty good now because we've just recently been well, we just two years ago went through it. Um, so would that work? Do you, have any of you had experience of bringing mass data across from a pretty modern system to another modern system? Well, not for not for Leganto, we didn't. No. Okay. Um, no. We went to Alma and, and Primo at the same time as Flinders at the end of 2013. Okay. And we continued using Alma, of course, reserves and Equella as a separate system, but they didn't. Sure. Equella didn't really talk to Alma. It was separate, so... Yeah, so the Equella import we did, um, it was basically spreadsheets, okay. and we gave them to Exlibris, and then Exlibris loaded them into the system for us. Um, so the main time-consuming bit was us getting the spreadsheets out um, of Equella and in a format um, okay. that um, Exlibris could do it, but once we gave Exlibris the files, um, they did a test for us, and then they loaded everything in. So that was part of the implementation support we had. We, did, we didn't have anything previously. We just had Blackboard, so we were just making everything up brand new. God, in I'll just yeah, add something in there. <coughs> One thing we did, because we were getting rid of the um, <coughs> digital resources register, we did, which was very clunky and not modern by any means, we, were, we did get a, a report of digitisations that we knew had been used in the previous 12 months and figured that they were going to be used again. Um, got a an export of that um, into a spreadsheet, which I then converted into a risk file, and I created a list in there and said, this is our migration stuff. And so we had them in a list which was just for the use of migration, and then we added those citations into various lists that they needed okay. to be in. So, you know, quite labour intensive, yeah. but in a pinch it kind of did what we wanted. We did pretty much the same thing with you as a... Um, <coughs> I guess it's something for ex but I'm just wondering if if that export would be pretty compatible with Leganto, so you wouldn't have to go through the whole spreadsheet again and export into a format that you could just take across straight away. Because mm -hmm. otherwise that in itself, mm -hmm. you know, we've got so many lists. <laughs> well, it depends on your data as well, I think, yeah. because we, we contemplated doing what Flinders did and getting everything out of Equella, but decided that we, we did something like Peter said, um, where we actually identified material that had been used mm -hmm. through Equella a couple of times. <laughs> that manually did yeah. the work to get it into, into Leganto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Anyway, better move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the second theme is relationships, effects and changes, um, structure and team changes. Not long before Leganto started, we actually had a restructure, so we sort of had to make Leganto fit with, with what we had um, and didn't make any changes. We've heard we have a research and academic liaison <coughs> team, a student experience team, and a collection and access team. So each team actually does a little bit with Leganto, so there's a lot of cross-team um, collaboration. Um, and because we ran the pilot for such a long time, we did have, uh, you know, a lot of courses were still using the old sort of course reserve type system, so we had staff who were able to make comparisons and um, the digitisation process, they were quite impressed with that, particularly the copyright and things like that. Um, as for relationships, for me it was a good opportunity because I'd just joined the library um, and so I got to you know, really get to know all the teams within the library. Um, we also have a lot of campuses that do part of the Leganto processing as well, so it's not just at the Sunshine Coast campus, we have Fraser Coast and Caboolture. Um, it cemented a, a partnership with our teaching and learning centre, so both the technical staff, because we had to work together on the integration for Blackboard, and the support staff, they embraced Leganto straight away. We've got a Foundations of Universities teaching course that is um, mandatory for all new academic staff. So the training, the teaching and learning centre put that straight on Leganto. So all new academic <coughs> academics were exposed to using Leganto straight away. Um, so there was a lot of cross-team cl collaboration with workflows and you know, fine-tuning and re-engineering sort of business processes. Um, I did a little staff survey um, on the library staff just to talk about the relationships and most, most people uh, answered the, the survey. People who didn't didn't have anything to do with Leganto. 
and 30% of staff felt that it, it strengthened their relationships with the academics. The other 70 didn't say it didn't, that it just nothing had changed. Um, and about 35% of staff thought that it improved relationships within their team and with other teams, so the use of Leganto. And 70% of the staff felt that <coughs> it definitely changed responsibilities. Some volunteered the information that it increased their workload. Um, others enjoyed the challenge of Leganto. So, yeah, that's about all. Um, so from the library perspective, um, for relationships, I'll probably talk more about um, the university bits. So as I mentioned, hinted at, we had a restructure. Um, so that meant readings, which effectively was me, moved down to the resources area, um, which uh, then has technical um, librarians, five of them, that work across document delivery, acquisitions, um, readings, all of those kind of things. So that was a big um, structure change and team change. So there was a lot of training involved, um, but the resources team uh, is really um, collaborative um, and works really well together. So I think that that was actually a benefit um, to having Leganto come in because it helped. It had a project and we all um, banded together during that time. For the relationships built um, externally, uh, I've already mentioned OLS and Kilt. So um, I. I like to say that the Leganto project helped uh, um, embed the library into their practices. So now um, the, some resources staff members attend the OLS sprints, um, so we've got tickets in there. Um, for the KILT team, we're part of the rollover process for Moodle sites, so we're just embedded in the rollover Moodle now. Um, so it's just part of default, we're in their little checklist, um, we're in their help guide. So it's really built the um, collaborative relationship there. We're also working with those teams to create best practice guides um, to look at um, you know, best practice for students um, in the Moodle sites and things like that. There's also a teaching and learning framework that's come out at Flinders um, this year. So the future is looking like that we're going to collaborate with the teaching and learning teams to see how Moodle can benefit um, their staff and students in providing better experiences at university. Um, so I think that's a really great benefit that's come from the Leganto project, um, that we're getting that kind of cross collaboration in, within the university. Um, so I think for me personally, I felt like the biggest impact in a way was on our um, course reserves team who do all the digitizations because um, we were asking them for the pilot to manage you know a small section of lists in one way and learn the software and then do the normal thing for everything else um, so there was that dual thing going on um, they also had new roles and responsibilities so previously it was the academic asking the librarian for something who'd ask the course reserves person to do the work and then send it back up the chain or along the chain um, so now our course reserves team could um, actually speak directly to academics via a list so that was new and different um, and they also had an increase um, in what they could do in terms of being able to suggest a purchase from the list too which was brand new um, reliance between other teams um, yeah, became a little bit different as well so the way that we've set it up is that we would like librarians to take a first look at any new list and then assign tags and statuses so that the course reserves team then can just pick those things up and work on them um, so previously it wasn't like that it was it was a similar style with the emailing but um, now they actually have, the librarians actually have to do a thing um, before the course reserves team can do their thing so there's an extra reliance into team in that way um, and then we also had to just ask everyone to be okay with the evolving nature of Leganto so between the monthly releases um, between our tickets getting answered and then also um, Peter and I trying to improve our processes it was in a state of flux so you know that's not always how everyone likes to work but um, yeah I think everyone yeah got through it okay um, in terms of the relationships we already had a really fantastic relationship with our IT services so um, Peter had done a lot of groundwork in making sure that they knew this project was coming and working with them um, and I think it was a really good opportunity to, in, uh, with the project advisory group and project teams, just to know more of the executives in the university, um, as well as build more relationships with the Office of Learning and Teaching. So, to me, there was yeah a, a bit of that going on too. I was just going to say we all sort of did similar things, but we decided to 
concentrate on various aspects. So I'm going to say we did a lot of stuff that Sarah did. We did a lot of stuff that, so we did all of that as well. But um, for us, the the course readings team that we created, you know, they had to create all of these reading lists coming in. We didn't actually get librarians. They are the librarians, so they didn't have. They they just got the reading lists. They had to process them, and all of a sudden they're all coming in. So we did get a lot of collaboration from other departments within the library, and got help from them to do things like the digitisation process, which is a lengthy process. It's probably the most time consuming for us. Uh, so we got them to do that and we got other staff to help moving stuff into high use so it was sort of divvied out a little bit. Our strategy though then had to become something like, let's just concentrate on the material for the first three weeks of the semester, get that in and ready for the students and then move forward. So it's a continual, it's ongoing, which is great. It's, it's actually working quite well. So we are trying to ensure a smooth workflow as well for various things like purchase requests. So we had purchase requests turned on so that the course reading staff, basically we're trying to get them to do everything. It's even changing now and perhaps getting them to do the ordering going forward, like they do everything uh, for those reading lists. We also did some of the things these guys said about relationship building and I do think that we've got better um, visibility, the library's now got better visibility with the IT department, so they now do include us on things, and if they are making changes to Canvas, which is our LMS, uh, they do consult with us. We're also trying to help eliminate silos within the library, um, and we worked with our learning designers, so they are the ones who kind of teach the academics how to use Leganto, we provided them with material and made sure they were fully up to speed before we started all of this. Now on it might not be a question, it might be something that you did at your institution for the Ganto. I've got a good question. <coughs> Sorry. Um, just in relation to the material, um, did that material come from ex libris or did you have to write some of it? Material. Oh, so the training, the training was. Oh no, we wrote it all. Does ex libris have? They have some, but we didn't want to use it. Okay. We decided to create our own. You didn't think it was tailored well enough? Yeah, tailored well enough. We did FAQs and frequently, you know, not frequently asked questions, quick reference guides as okay. well. So some of the, yeah, the staff just decided that wasn't what they wanted to use, okay. so they created their own. And they're continuing to create it as we move yeah. forward, make changes, yeah. adjusting it. If you guys feel that the ex-libris um, was... We're on a oh, quite tight time sorry. frame here, and I want to get the ladies back an opportunity to ask. Yeah, so I just want to revisit the digitalisation process. So at the moment we have all our um, scanned um, images on a separate server, it's called Image Server. I think it's known as something else. Mm -hmm. you th uh, and obviously you said um, previously you extracted, extracted it out as an Excel sheet. Um, did you, That's fine. did Ex Libris actually help you align that to every reading list? Is that what you indicated? Yes, so part of our implementation, um, so we did move a lot over manually, um, yeah, but, but avoid that <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got, um, so part of the implementation, uh, if you've got a spreadsheet, um, or you get a spreadsheet, there's a yeah. certain way that it has to be configured, and yeah. then um, Ex Libris will load it in, and that creates oh, wow. courses, oh. reading lists, and citations for you. It is, I think it's in the knowledge, um, it is in the knowledge I think so. I Yes. I'll double check and then um, yeah, catch me at lunchtime and I'll, I'll I will. Get, give you my email. Okay, it's a one-off yep. option they offer as part of the implementation. Yep. Okay. Yes. I was going to say, when the paper files, we're pulling something from the class, but we're actually pulling sort of implementations from the digital objects in as well. We're just starting the process of doing that um, at USQ. So if you want to talk to us, and we're not doing it for me, because we're doing it ourselves using APIs and course over jobs that our systems are running. It was a big, <laughs> it was a big learning curve. So it's. Okay. Yeah. Um, just to keep ourselves on schedule, we'll move on to the next. Yeah, one. hopefully we'll have time at the end for some more. Um, so now we're going to talk about staff and student engagement and how we approach this. Um, so at Flinders. For the pilot, we had one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, so we had 14 topic coordinators, so there was time for me to go out to each individual one and talk to them. For the next phases, though, um, 
We've, my mailing list for topic coordinators is 536 staff at the moment, so there's not really enough uh, time in the day to do one-on-ones. So we created um, a LibGuide, um, which I mentioned is embedded in the Flow Help Support as well, which is our Moodle support. Um, so we created a LibGuide that we tried to be comprehensive so that if they were off campus, um, they could go in and access it. We also did a lot of promotion, um, which I think everyone does, through newsletters, emails, um, college uh, meetings, those kind of things. Um, thankfully, our connection with Kilt, um, they all loved Leganto, so they had the direct ear of um, topic coordinators as they're creating sites and they became our champions for us. Um, some of them went above and beyond, um, so that was great. Uh, for um, each semester we run workshops. We don't get much uptake of these workshops, um, but we've found that they're extremely beneficial for the staff that do come. So we've had multiple staff that come, they're a bit angry that they have to actually start doing things themselves, and by the end of the session we do our little spill that our service hasn't changed, we'll create the list for you, and they're all like, no, no, I'm going to do it, I'll go do it. Um, and then they'll call us and be like, oh, I forgot what this is. Um, so while we're not getting much uptake, we'll continue doing the workshops because it is an opportunity. We also have drop-in sessions um, at the start of term, so that if they haven't looked at their reading lists until the week before class, which I'm sure none of your topic coordinators do. Um, there's times where they can come into the library and get help. Um, so again, uptake is small, but it's extremely beneficial to the staff that do come to those. I will move on to the next button then. <laughs> um, cool. So I'm just going to uh, talk about them in a bit of a model, in a way. But um, so in our first semester of pilot, we about six weeks in, we decided to survey all the students who were currently in pilot subjects and see what they thought. Um, so that was really good to get um, to be informed on what we should include in our student LibGuide. Um, so I, I created a student LibGuide and also a staff LibGuide. Um, and so one of the things that popped out of that was that students wanted some start of semester training similar to, you know, EndNote or RefWorks or something like that on how to use Leganto. Um, and so in the pilot that was taken up a little bit, but it hasn't really been um, since. So I think because it's pretty user friendly, I think that's just become the norm that people are happy just to have a go and use it. Um, but we still offer that um, with our correspondence to academics throughout semester. Um, and we also had a good opportunity to present at a few um, learning and teaching weeks. So we kind of got a lot of people knowledge about the product um, around in key points um, early on in the pilot. So a lot of people knew about it and became our pilot um, participants that way. Um, Peter attended a lot of all staff meetings to just physically show the software and how it worked and how easy it was. Um, we had a lot of um, the first um, pilot participants sort of just um, telling their colleagues about it. So word of mouth was a pretty strong way that we got extra people involved. Yeah, so it did jump up. We had like 10 people initially and then we had about 50 people in the second semester of pilot. I'm not sure how many, how many academics we've had this year, but I mean, it would be a lot more than that. Um, with training, new staff um, during the pilot were offered one-on-one -on -one sessions in their offices. So I would go there, um, bring on the, along the librarian as well, and we would show them how to click through and do all that kind of stuff. That really helped me refine what I would put into the guide. Um, so I'd leave them with the guide at the end, but just in terms of what they needed to know and how to structure it on all of that, um, we created a, a really clear guide um, so that at least they could do that themselves afterwards. And we didn't have too much follow-up and in some cases, some people just used the guide themselves and they were able to like just make a list um, without any help at all. Um, yeah, so, okay, thank you. So yeah, the guides were very popular. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. Um, we did something similar. I mean, we, we did one-on-one -on -one for the 16 for the pilot, um, did training, one-on-one -on -one training, but yeah, you can't do it after that. So um, we just have all those quick reference guides, etc. I mentioned. Um, we did a verbal assessment at the end of the pilot. Hey, did you like it? Did you not like it? And everyone went, well, we loved it. The learning designers loved it. So we said, let's go for it. Um, we do get queries just via email or phone to the course readings team. Um, we're actually starting now to use some of the analytics reports that are available and also looking to see uh, what else we can get because we've had discussions with our learning designer analytics team 
and they're trying to provide information to the academics about uh, students who might be at risk, and we're trying to see how we can do that. You can't do it at the moment because all the data is anonymised. So you can say, yeah, 50 students out of the 100 looked at it, but you can't say which students. So we're talking to Ex Libris about that. Um, and yeah, I'm, and I'm actually listening to what the other guys on the panel are, are doing because it's always interesting to see because they're kind of, maybe some of them are a little bit ahead of us. So we're starting to plan for next year as well now. That's our future plans. What are we doing for next year? Do we do any training, etc.? cetera? Um, so very similar, we do uh, workshops and one-on-one -on -one training. Um, we have lib guides with quick guides, help guides, frequently asked questions and video tutorials. Uh, we surveyed the students in the first pilot, the first year, and did formal feedback sessions with course coordinators and the liaison librarians in that first pilot. Um, future plans, there's a Leganto Librarian Analytics Dashboard, which I'd um, like to have a look into, particularly the impact analysis section. Um, I'd like to increase engagement with our teaching and learning set, uh, centre. We have a large percentage of courses that don't, either don't have reading lists or they didn't publish. So we're just wondering what they're doing. And um, so it'd be good to find out you know, why they're not using it. Perhaps they don't need it. Um, and maybe it could be time to uh, survey the students again. You would go through the right channels to, to have permission to survey the students, but you could put it at, you know, in, as a citation in, the, in a reading list for those instructors who are interested in doing that. Um, yeah, that's all, I think, for future plans. Yeah, I'm just going to say that librarian dashboard, there was a session that the Ansredge Committee held, and so it's on the Ansredge uh, website, if you wanted to have a look at that. So, has anyone got reflections or um, comments on the work that they've done in engagement and with staff? No? Okay. I'll just add, yep. Exlibris also have a communications team. They'll get in touch with you when you start an implementation um, to provide information. They're trying to gather stuff from customers all over the, the world and then share that anonymously, but you know, like what they did, etc. Um, and I just wanted to add on the engagement. Um, so the instructors seem to love Leganto. Um, so this year alone, I've got the stats here. Um, we've had over 10,000 citations made by teaching staff and not all of them are names that I know. So they didn't come to our sessions, they just found the guide and the link. Um, so they do love the self-serve yep. nature of Leganto. Yeah. Cool. So our last theme to talk on today is what has happened after implementation. Um, so I'll just go through the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, so. We've got a number of reports set up to help us make sure we don't miss anything. Um, so every day the librarian team get a list of newly created um, lists from the day before and then they're supposed to assign themselves and do that first amount of checking. Um, we also get a report on what, what citations have got digitisations but not copyright um, completions. So I go and look at that uh, a few times a week. And then our copyright officer has a report set up that she can just go and have a look at for people who've put up self-declared copyright items just to check that that is um, happening as we would expect it to. Um, from Blackboard, we get a list of codes uh, every day that have been merged. So where two subjects have been merged in Blackboard, we replicate that in Alma so that everyone can still access their lists. Um, we also get a list of, or a report that contains every Blackboard site that doesn't have the resource list, we call it resource lists, um, doesn't have that link turned on to students. So if we know we've been working on a list but they haven't quite done that their part, we can um, get in contact with them about that. Um, the, this is all from the Digital Library Services team, so I'm just going to read out what they do. Um, they update the due back dates for books staying in reserve to cut down on manual handling. Um, they look after the, the rollovers, so in week 10 everything gets rolled over ready for anyone who wants to work on it. Um, of course academics can choose to roll over at any time they like, but that happens as a bulk job. And then after the teaching period has finished, we lock all the lists so that people don't accidentally go back and work on an old list thinking they're working on a new list, and also so it preserves that um, list for that specific cohort to um, look back at. Um, and then ev every week we get the enrolment enrollment numbers um, updated as well. 
So now that the pilot's over, um, in my, I'm back in a librarian position. I'm just um, kind of acting as the Leganto liaison in a way. So I go to the monthly releases and then update the guides and our team if there's anything that they need to do. Um, keep an eye on the merged subjects <coughs> and then um, also every day check that broken uh, link report. So when students mark it as broken, I respond to that too. So kind of look after those things. Mm. Yeah, we do something similar with the monthly releases, check to see what's there. I mean, sometimes Leganto was getting missed. We had Alma and Primo, but not Leganto. So we try to make sure that teams know about that. Um, but one interesting thing that came up recently, people were asking me why they were getting this new pop-up screen happening when they changed something. And I said, well, what did you change? And they said, well, we took the slash off the end of the citation for the title, it's got a slash on the end. And I said, why? Why are you doing that? Um, so yeah, we're trying to keep an eye on what the staff, they seem to be creating work. <laughs> um, uh, with the course load, we were using the course loader until very recently. Now we're using the API to update our courses. And the rollover, we've activated the instructor rollover. Um, there's a bit of a question for us about the um, permalinks, because you can only have the permalinks active in the old course or the new, or the reading list, or the new one. And we'd like them to be still active because sometimes there's an overlap Another customer's contacted me about that, so I'm trying to follow that up with um, Ex Libris. Uh, we're still going to decide, we still have to decide whether we're going to do a bulk rollover for next year, what are the pros and cons. We've also got reports to manage the lists and analyse copyright approval. And we always seem to be reviewing some part of the workflow to make sure it's smooth and automatic. Um. So we do the same with system staff work through the release notes and we demonstrate new functionality at a, a monthly meeting if there's something to show and if there's decisions on um, something to be enabled or disabled, the team leaders at the meeting will, will decide on that and we test before and after the release. Uh, with the course load and rollover systems, myself and Meredith do the both the, the loading of the courses. Instructors, we don't allow instructors to roll over. Um, and we, we don't have any integration with our course system into Alma either, so I load all the courses before e each semester and roll over. Um, I use a Power Query in Excel um, to prepare the, the course load files. Prior to that I was doing you know, pivot tables and lookup tables and index formula in, in Excel, but I found Power Query to be much more effective. Um, and at the end of these slides, I've just recorded a couple of little slides, 15 minutes, very basic functionality um, on how to use, how I use the Power Query editor to, to prepare the files. Um, yeah. Oh, the reports and workflows, so I think that much the same uh, reports, checking of copyright, there's, the digitisation process is quite long and there's one last step at the end that the way we've configured our system you have to manage the digital representation. That's often missed, so we do a little report to, to make sure that's been ticked. Um, and the operational staff have changed workflows quite um, significantly since I handed them over. So we used to do it through reading lists, but now we use the citation menu mm -hmm. and do that. And we've built quite a few citation statuses because we've got staff all over the place in different campuses. Um, we sort of use the citation statuses a lot to, you know, know which team needs to work on what, um, different things and I, I provide staff training ideally before the start of semester for, for library staff. The last time I did training they requested a, a full overview rather than just the little bit they did so I think they appreciated the whole um, you know, start to finish from what instructors do, what we do and right through to the end. Um, so similarly we do monthly um Resources staff will look at the monthly release. Um, we will do some testing in the sandbox if we need to, um, and we might have like a little think tank to see what we want to turn on um, or not, and we do that for Alma, Primo, and Leganto. Um, we've got a direct feed from Moodle that brings in all of the um, course information um, so that it's there, um, and uh, it updates the student numbers, but we are getting that locked at the census date so that they won't update because Moodle will go to zero at the end of the course, so we don't want to lose those numbers. Um, we have both rollover options available, so we have turned on rollovers for instructors and we also do a bulk rollover. Um, so we're actually 
Monday doing our prep for our next bulk rollover. Um, so we do that and then we also bulk publish um, a couple of weeks out before. So we time our bulk rollover so that when instructors have access to their Moodle site, they also have access to readings, which in the past is not um, a practice at Flinders. Used to be they'd get their reading list four weeks beforehand, but now they're getting it, um, you know, for 90 days before topic starts, so that's a good move. Um, for the workflows, we have a schedule. So one of our technical staff is um, assigned to do Leganto one afternoon a week. So they'll go in and they'll look at the um, citations ready for processing um, queue. Um, and if they're not assigned to the um, Leganto, but they've got time, they can go in and we've got a library processing um, of reading lists. So they'll go in there and they can grab work. So we use the inbuilt um, reading lists and citations and task lists for our workflow and staff just go in there and pick up in, um, work whichever way they can. Um, we also have a dashboard that we've created which has our reports for picking up items that don't have managed digital representations. Um, we've got our resources are hidden from Primo using the access right. So if you're interested, I can explain it at lunchtime. <laughs> but basically access rights then become really important um, in the digital repository. So we've got a report to pick up that to make sure that it happens so that they get suppressed from Primo. Um, We've also got reports on usage and we're going to, in future, look at how we can use those reports um, to provide better services for students and staff. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the... Let's see other questions um, on that one. Yeah, has anyone got any questions on after the presentation or comments or Great. thoughts? Yes, Brett. Um, maybe we're just really started with our current students. Is there anything that Um, I think there's something in the list recently yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, so I've forgotten which university. No, I can't remember, but we, we were all struggling with that a bit, I think. Yeah, and I have just made, so I did a report of reading courses that had a reading list, and then I did another course uh, report in analytics that used the, based on another analysis, um, to pick up courses that don't have reading lists but we haven't tested to see if it works properly. I'm pretty sure it was Peter. Peter posted something yes. recently about the same sort of thing where, um, where you can identify the courses that don't have reading lists. Yeah, and that I, works. Feel, I feel like it does work. Yeah. Uh, one issue I have is trying to get a report with start and end dates accurately for courses though, and that, that could be useful for identifying like past courses that you just want to get rid of those course records. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we'll have a, yeah. I guess everybody's got a sort of a retention policy on reading lists. Um, but these are courses. Yes, we're not deleting out. any courses that have reading lists. We're <laughs> only deleting the courses that haven't used the reading list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. um, I wanted to ask a question about resourcing the workflows, so for people doing all these tasks. And Lani, did you have to answer this question? Because I know the answer was that. So just in general terms, as far as the people that are doing these tasks, are they... Um, new people on the top of your established staff or people that are being retasked and if that's the case what are they not doing now that they would that um, talk now that Leganta has come along because I, um, we look at our mm -hmm. some of our workflows especially around the beginning of semester when you're just pivoting really hard mm -hmm. to get everything right and uh, you know for some people it's you know 50 to 60 percent of their time so it's a big impact. Well, for Adelaide, um, we had the team that was looking after Ed Queller. Okay. And so, so we took some team. of them, so yeah. they were experienced staff. Yeah. They didn't really know Alma, so they worked with us during the pilot to learn Alma and Leganto and some Primo. Um, so yeah, they were experienced. We didn't employ any new staff. 
and then we've gradually taken another couple of people, just to reassign them out of areas perhaps that we're, like with one lady I know was working on a thesis and that's kind of coming, that project's coming to a close, so she's been reassigned to help in the uh, course readings team. So that's the way we've done it. So, so we didn't have to, really, we didn't employ any new people. No. We just, because we decided like, we didn't want to have people still running the Aquella system this year and trying to do the Leganto at the same time. We thought that would be confusing for students if in one course they go here and one course they go there. So hence we just bit the bullet and said, let's just do it in Leganto. And so we were able to take those staff and just sort of retrain them a bit, but they were experienced librarians, so it wasn't too hard. We had the restructure, so it was just this is what your team is going to be. <laughs> um, we do have a casual though, um, so we've employed a casual, so he comes in during busy times um, and he'll do reading lists. Um, so we've found that the busy time for reading lists is also the busy time for acquisitions and the busy time for document delivery, so our staff get really stretched thin, so we do hire a casual um, during those times to help um, get the reading list turned over. Um, but then it's just a matter of prioritising. I think as Julie mentioned earlier, get the first couple of weeks up and then you've got time to get the rest done. Yeah, we, we had something similar to that. We wanted to impress on people that they didn't have to finish a whole list at, you know, in O week or something like that. So there's that. But in terms of the work, because we get the academics to make the lists, we don't have that burden unless a librarian wants to create a list, which they can do to help somebody out. We kind of um, don't have a heap of that the digitisation team were already doing that work in terms of opening it or making accessible uh, digital reading, so they're kind of just doing it in a new way, I think. So we haven't really added um, any people. And there's, oh, what were you going to say? Do you want me to kind of just jump in? Yeah, of course, yeah. I guess the other thing is that the, um, our TELs, our learning designers in the Office of yeah. Learning and Teaching, came on board as well. They have the course operator role and um, when they're giving support to new staff coming on, they will often just go, here, I'll convert your terrible looking list you've got in Blackboard into a Leganto oh, list. That's true. So they're actually mm. doing some of that as well. That's true. So it's that's not true. library, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we do that too. Mm -hmm. And you've also um, changed the configuration so that things auto-complete a lot more yeah. than they used to. So we're not trawling through millions of things and clicking complete, complete, complete on books and things like that that we hold. So. Things like that are helping us as well. We also have auto purchase request rules for things that we don't hold. So yeah. purchase request goes straight to the acquisitions team to deal with if, as soon as someone tags it as uh, um, recommended or prescribed. Reserved, yeah, prescribed, whatever it is. <laughs> the terminology I've forgotten mm. for a moment. And they sent to library. So those are the two conditions. If it's not in repository, it automatically goes into. Yeah, we looked at those that the team said that they don't actually get that many purchase requests, they'd rather handle them manually and make a decision themselves. Okay, we've got 10 minutes now to the end of the session. So we can just another question. Yeah, we can keep taking questions. Yeah. Um, sorry, Sarah, you mentioned um, you organise training for the students in the week. What sort of training do they need? Well, um, I, I just sort of looked at at the system from this point of view of a student and thought, what would I like to know? So things like how to filter a list by things you've read or not read, how to filter it by you know content type, um, just how the list was structured, so what kinds of things they should expect to see. So <coughs> most, um, most academics use it in the weekly structure, some use it on like a topic style structure. So just things like that and what they might see between different courses. Um, how to save things to their My Collection, how to add the Cite It button so they can save things from the web, um, how to export in different um, Stop. referencing styles with a huge caveat that it may not be quite correct. Um, and then, yeah, the guide that I made, I kind of, it's, it's all of that sort of stuff in a video format, um, like a three minute video, and I just said to the academics that they may choose to put that into their Blackboard site or into the list as the first item if they wanted to have that extra kind of um, teaching or well, list style teaching uh, resource available. So, yeah. Okay. I'll just add to that too. We've got a couple of um, super legato users. Um, one of them was in the pilot and had committed to it. She was really worried, oh no, I've got to learn something else. And she came along and after I mm. 15, 20 minutes with Sarah, 
she um, she went away and had created her own list, the whole list for the whole semester in about 15, 20 minutes, and was absolutely converted. And she actually puts her list up in class mm. and goes and directs students to use it and sort of showcases mm. it to them as well. So they're all over it. Um, yeah, I was just <coughs> going to say on that, I'm looking at the moment on the list that have had the most success and what factors might mm. contribute to that. Yeah. So. I've sent out a survey to our academics that have had the most successful list and tried to say like, you know, when do you introduce it? How do you show it to them? Do you refer to it weekly and, and stuff like that? So getting some data. So hopefully we'll be able to share something by the end of the year around that topic too. There's mm -hmm. also a, a report that, it, I think it's actually a Rista out of the box report that's impact analysis. And so you can have a look to see you know, if they've got public notes, if they've used public mm -hmm. notes, what was the uptake from the students? Mm -hmm. Or if they've got tags, what was the uptake? And, how many citations they had in the list, <coughs> that sort of thing. Um, it, was it used, not used, how much material was used, that sort of thing. Mm. So that's quite, we're starting to look at that now, to sort of get a feel for what we might need to do for next year. So um, I've got a question. Yep. Um, just, we turned on the list advisor, we call it list optimizer, it's not like yeah. we're advising our academics how to do anything, we're just <laughs> giving them the choice to optimize their list. Um, do you all have that turned on? Do you know? Okay. We turned it off. Yeah, we yeah. turned it off. Uh, we turned it and student discussions off after consulting with the KILPS team. We yeah. have we have students discussions off by default, but the yeah. academic can still oh, turn okay. that on if they want to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we don't advertise it though. No, we don't <laughs> advertise it either. We don't advertise much at all. <laughs> we just find that they if we rely on their digital literacy and and how easy Legato is to use, and we found, even though pe people we didn't contact at all, because we did do that at the beginning of this year, um, all of a sudden there's reading lists, because they just found mm -hmm. it, and they just started, and it is easy for them to actually create a reading list, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, exporting function for students is something that we promote a lot, but as you yeah, said, we do need big asterisks next to it. <laughs> <laughs> one, one more question, just a question to share. So just, um, we're having general trouble with the idea. Um, do you have VE or what are you on? We're in Primo, but uh, I didn't mention it because time ran out, but digitisation is a big pain point for us. Um, so next week, actually, um, we're going to review our entire digitisation process. So at the moment, we have separate digital bib records and we hide those bib records from Primo, but I know that other universities do different yeah. ways. Yeah, there's lots of um, different things to do. Yes. but They all have problems. But yeah, it all depends on how you're configured. So um, we've got other digital collections, so we couldn't hide all of those. Um, so I think other people might use the public notes function. Um, yeah. So we're going to, I was going to try and hit up a few people at lunchtime, um, and we're going to investigate that. So it is... We're suppressing our digital records, but the digital process is pulling the whole thing from the I just, want to, I just want to share just the way we're doing rollovers at USP because it's a little bit different. So we've actually got ours treated from Google course migration. So when an academic goes into course migration Google and automatic process triggers back to using the API and then the Ganto, which in the overnight is run and so that you don't think those are because so they're not touching. So there's a personal pilot that's working. <laughs> If you want to have a go and just go log into menti.com, and if you haven't already, <coughs> and the code is 264156, hopefully that still works. And it doesn't matter if you don't use Leganto, just any, any reading list, what, what you think in one or two words, what makes a successful list. And we'll have a look at the results in a minute. Oh, yeah, so we can bring it up. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah.
So as a result, we couldn't list the course because it couldn't it couldn't be uploaded into the system. Huh? And then they had to recode it, and it was all it was really complicated. Have you come across anything where Leganto, the, the structure of it, meant it couldn't service your requirements? No. No. Okay. No. We've just sometimes we've created courses manually in Alma if they haven't come through from the Canvas feed. Yeah. Uh, and then made sure owners, because you have to have an owner on the on the course and the reading list, etc. And that all seems to work just fine. They can get through as long as they can get through it from Canvas. Yeah. That link works. And you're you're on Canvas, aren't you? Yeah, we're Canvas as well. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh, okay. No, we haven't had any problems. Good. So, oh, where are we? so the, this um, builds a word cloud, and any words that are larger means more people have entered that information in. So, like, it's <laughs> dynamic. Um, so, relevant is obviously something that a lot of people have read, uh, entered accurate. Up to date. Yeah. Yeah. Links worked. Links worked just went up a bit higher. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we did find from the analytics reports that um, more citations doesn't necessarily mean students look at everything. No. There's a, what we were saying, I think, about mm. 20 to 20 to 25 students had the highest impact that. for our um, ideal yeah. Yeah. Kind of number of citations. We find ones that are um, broken up into sections are much easier for students to navigate, so we find that they come back to those resources again and again. Um, yeah, if they're just going in a list, seeing 50 and getting daunted. We just find if they don't, if that first one doesn't work, they move into the next one as well. If it's electronic resources, they just give up, they just go to the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's how students work. And that's, oh, that's the, um, the links to the Power Query, how I, how I use it. If you're going to cope with my voice, my monotone voice, and <laughs> me saying um 45 times. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, they're about 15 minutes long, but it, it's obviously not going to work for everyone because everyone you know, has a different structure for their courses. But if anything else, it might show you how, to, how easy that tool is to use in Excel if you haven't used it before. We've got our contact details in the, our email addresses in the slides. No. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, can I ask everyone to thank uh, Julie, Lane, Renata, and Thank you for being brave enough to take a, a new um, approach to the presentation. It was really interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thank you Sarah, much. for the PowerPoint. Thank, Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to break now for lunch. Um, Thanks,